Ever since one human took up a tool and struck down another, they have been there. Powerful entities, forged by our desire to fight amongst ourselves, lurking in the shadow of humanity. The blades. Each blade is always with you, hovering just out of sight until called to your hand. With it, you are invincible, unstoppable. You gain superhuman senses and prowess, and shrug off the effects of lesser weapons. Only another one of the Chosen can stand in your way. Yet power comes with a price. It always does. If your resolve should falter, you may lose yourself to the will of the blade. Acting on its ancient enmities forged into its very being, your blade will not hesitate to use you as the instrument of its own vengeance. But the risk is worth it. You have one purpose. You have the strength of will. All you need is a little more power. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildred, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. Let's talk a moment about core ideas and what makes a role playing game. While everyone's got their own definitions, two things that people gravitate towards in their definitions are the presence of a GM and the rolling of dice. In some cases, typically from the grog end of the spectrum, it's argued that lacking these makes it not an RPG, as if to say an RPG puts sugar in its porridge. While I personally don't go with a definition so stringent, I also don't go with the everything is subjective attitude of places like the Forge. For the sake of brevity, the core of an RPG is the marriage of narrative and mechanics, fluff and crunch, if you will. This brings us to today's entry, Blade Bind, a GM-less RPG that utilizes playing cards instead of dice. Does lacking these items make it less of an RPG? Let's find out. Created by Craig Judd and published by Powerframe Games, Bladebind runs at a mere 77 pages in a single column format. The text is pretty clear and it shows a good balance of cover. Given that Judd is also the illustrator, the few illustrations that are present wear the manga influences on its sleeve. I also like the use of red and black to reflect the playing card aesthetic in its mechanics. And best of all, it's got an index. Good stuff all around. In Bladebind, the characters are individuals chosen by sentient blades, called Chosen, and contest their wills against other chosen, and their own blades wrestling control from them. Character creation is a structured affair, containing a small bit of interplay with the others on the table. On the other hand, you could randomize each part of the process with a card draw. Either way, character creation relies on five pillars. Concept, Knot, Threads, Will, and Power. For the purposes of this, we'll be randomizing each entry with card draws. Concept is your character's core archetype, typically a rough appearance and temperament. The concept we drew was the Five of Clubs, which has the result of socialite and selfish. Given that, a potential concept is that of a social butterfly, a playboy who lives for the spotlight. Step two is Blade. Now a Chosen will always have a blade, which is a semi-sentient weapon that takes the form of a large sword, existing outside of reality until it's summoned. While the blade may be bound to its Chosen soul, it has a will of its own. In our Chosen's case, we drew a two, so it will be bound to Varger, a bestial sword that fits his desire for fame. Step three is relationships. Relationships tie the chosen with each other, and determine how they may interact with each other. As such, I won't be able to detail it like the others since it's determined by the separate players at the table. But in our case, we drew an eight of hearts and a nine of hearts. Consulting the chart, he's protective of one of the other chosen, whose equal parts rival and companion. Step four is knots. In simplest terms, a knot is something a Chosen believes in, something they're willing to fight for. Unlike other aspects, this can be altered throughout the game's progression. Drawing the King of Spades, his knot is a weapon. Step 5 is Threads. Threads are the goals and ambitions the Chosen have, and they also provide will to their Chosen to resist the blade's influence. A Chosen defines three threads. The first is tied to their knot, while the other two are tied to another Chosen's knots or to the Chosen themselves. A thread is composed of three parts, subject, intent, and object, and is rated either as loose, secured, or cut. Now looking at the chart on threads, the threads we'll go with are as follows. First, I will defeat my rival, which is a loose and strong thread. Second, I will control Durandal, which is a loose and strong thread like first one. And third, my rival will not control Durandal, 
which is a secure and weak threat. Step six is will and power, which demonstrates your control over the blade. If your power is greater than your will, the blade takes control and you become a blade bound. All chosen start with one, two, or three points of will, depending on the number of players. For the purposes of this, we'll go with three will at the start. Your threads will also add will depending on their state. In our case, the threads provide us with two will each, adding up to nine will. Power, on the other hand, determines the strength of your blade and allows you to accumulate resonance to use for your blade's techniques. All chosen begin with two power. Finally, there's enmity, which represents the blade that your own has an innate hatred towards. This is generated randomly between the characters. In our case, Varger's enmity is Kunlun, which is wielded by his rival. Character creation is fairly quick, as one would expect from a narrativist-style game. However, it might be tricky for some due to how the process is dependent on linking your character's narrative between the others in the party. It shows that while the game claims to be GM-less, it kind of isn't for reasons we'll get to later on. Overall, the character creation process requires a bit of cooperation, which your knowledge may vary over. Some people prefer to have their character creation done in isolation from each other. Bladebind's mechanics revolve around the duels between the Chosen and the framing of the scene where the conflict occurs. Scenes focus on the Chosen moving to achieve their goals, vying for control of their blades, and attempting to gain an advantage against the other Chosen. Each Chosen plays on a scene that is one of three types, decisive, manipulative, and wavering. A decisive scene depicts a Chosen striking at a knot in play. A manipulative scene attempts to influence the actions of another Chosen or their knot. And a wavering scene covers any scene that's outside of the aforementioned scene type. Dueling, the meat of the mechanics, are when two Chosen are at an impasse over a knot. At the start of a duel, your blade may offer to bargain with you, which if you accept, you can increase your power by one. Regardless if they accept or reject the offer, both Chosen draw cards equal to their power. When both blades are drawn, the duel proper proceeds in five steps. First is Engage, where the combatants reveal one card that they drew. Whoever drew the highest card gains initiative. If the result is a draw, the combatants are in a bind, and if either draws a joker, they can replace it with another card. Second is Attack, where the chosen with initiative may either play one of their cards as an attack or a feint with a joker. In the latter's case, you may draw a card and replace the joker with that card. Third is Defense where the defender must play at least one card or lose the duel. The difference between defense and attack determines the result. If the defender is higher, they may parry to play their own attack, or counter to turn the counter into an attack, if the suits match. If the two draw, the blades bind, causing both sides to draw a card and gain one resonance. The next move must be a wind to determine who gets initiative. If the defender wins with at least two cards, they evade, forcing the combatant's cards to reset. If the defender's is lower with a matching suit, they may dodge, causing the attacker to miss but keep initiative. And if the defender loses, they are hit and lose the duel. Fourth is the next motion, essentially return to the attack if exchange hasn't ended, unless a disengage was declared. And fifth is disengage, at which the combatants discard their cards and draw one or two cards, depending on timing. I should note that resonance is the power source for the three techniques each blade possesses which is capped by the Chosen's power. They gain resonance in several ways. First, when a pair of blades bind, both gain one resonance. If one of them binds against its enmity, it gains an extra point of resonance. Additionally, you gain a point if you lose a duel. Each blade has a power that costs them one, two, or three points with different requirements to activate. When a duel ends, the victor may alter a knot or rewrite a thread from either the defeated Chosen or for themselves. Dueling appears complicated on first glance, but the fact that its resource management is minimized to just resonance and power, and that the dueling system revolves around card results, makes it a little bit less so. Additionally, the character sheet provides an easier reference to the primary actions available in a given duel. But because it's based on luck of the draw, I could see where bad draws could make reversals much more difficult. Bladebind cites Tenra Bancho Zero as one of its influences. And much like Tenra, it's not entirely suited to long-term campaigns. This is a game that works best in one-shots or short arcs at best. Furthermore, the character interplay and the knot mechanic make it a little less suited to more structured play. Its dueling mechanic, while well done, is possibly a little too dependent on luck for some people. 
I don't completely agree with that, but I could see that being an issue for some. It is, for lack of a better term, a very specific kind of game. Story games are a hard sell due to their narrow focus and lack of more traditional aspects of an RPG. Because of that, the highest rating I can give for this is playable. Fans of manga-style role-playing will undoubtedly get more out of this than others, as well as fans of games with depth in melee combat. But I can never only see this as a side game, not the primary focus of a given table. 